Excuse me, I have something to say. This is the podcast where we have real and open conversations about life and everything it throws our way. I'm your host, Sean Philip Naylor, and you can join me each episode as I talk with inspiring people who also have something to say. You can also join in on the conversations by contacting me directly through the show's official social channels, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at excuse me underscore pod, Facebook and YouTube, search excuse me, I have something to say, or visit our official website, excuse me, I have something to say dot com. As always, all links are embedded into the show notes for you. And don't forget to click on that subscribe button. And if you're listening through Apple Podcasts, remember you can rate and review the show there. Hello, you lovely lot. How are you? How have you been? I hope you've been good. I've been good. To be honest, I've actually been pretty busy with the day job, getting prepared and ready for the silly season, spending time with family and attempting to look after myself and my mental health as best as possible whilst always trying to show up and be present. This time of year can be pretty exhausting, but I know that you all know that. So please just remember to make sure that you're taking the time for yourselves and you're taking time to check in with yourselves this holiday season. Thank you all so much for joining me this week for another episode of Excuse Me. A big welcome back to you, the regular listeners, and a huge hello and welcome to any of you first-time listeners tuning in today. If you like what you hear today, then please remember to like and follow and share the show. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, remember that you can rate and review the show there. This really helps to bring the episodes to a wider audience. And you never know who might need to hear one of the topics we're talking about. Now, can you believe it is December already? The holidays are now among us and we'll have some fun and some fun and festive holiday content coming up for you very soon. But this week, though, I've invited back to the show my very good friend, previous guest and excuse me fan favorite, the one and only Miss Rochelle Lindquist. Rochelle has certainly taken 2021 by the reins. She's taken some big risks, both personally and professionally, and she's basically made this global pandemic and this global reset her bitch as she continues to inspire and impress with her confidence, her resilience, and her positivity. I'm not going to say too much about what Rochelle has been up to. I'll leave that to her. But please, guys, join me in welcoming back Rochelle to the show. Rochelle, how are you, my lovely? Oh, I'm good, Sean. Thank you. That was such a beautiful intro. I feel I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. (laughs) But you are worthy because you did all those things yourself. So like, you're completely worthy. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of such a glorious human. I am. I'm fabulous and I'm wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, it's one of those, it's going to be one of those episodes where it's just a big love fest, isn't it? It is. It always is when it's the two of us, you know, it's yeah. not, it's definitely not unrequited though. And that's a good thing. <laughs> It is a good thing. So, okay, I gave you your little intro. I've said that you've you've taken 2021 by the reins. I've said you've made some big changes. Obviously, when you and Daniel came onto the podcast early this year and we touched briefly, well, we spoke at length about being vegan curious. Being vegan curious? Yes, but we also touched a little yep. bit on what you guys have been up to. But now is the time to share what have you actually been doing in these past, gosh, what has it been, like seven months? It's been a while. Like, you mean since we got down here? Yeah. What have you or, been doing? So I got married, like, obviously, because I like to drop that in anytime I can. And you and Daniel came to the wedding of the year. It was amazing. Uh, your hair. Uh, best wedding hair. I've ever been to. <laughs> amazing everybody looked amazing it was great you danced in front of a giant love sign it was gorgeous and then you uprooted your entire life yeah we did we you know we just disappeared and when we came to the wedding we had no plans to do that so April of this year let's you know take I'll take you back in time to April to the most beautiful wedding I've ever attended in my life (laughs) 
where, you know, I was a carefree, young ragamuffin of a girl. But no, we we were there and we had this beautiful time with you guys. And in April, we had zero plans to move anywhere. We were living in our apartment in Brisbane City pretty happily. I was studying and working and my plan more broadly was to start my own business, but I was going to wait until I got through my um, diploma of graphic design and then I was going to like build it up slowly and all that kind of thing. And we basically found ourselves kind of thrust into a position where all these pointers and the universe were basically saying, it's time to move. It's time for a big change. You know, we just had one circumstance after another that kind of just pushed us into a place like stepping stones until we were on the edge of this massive change, which was leaving Brisbane city, selling all of our stuff and moving with just a suitcase down to Tasmania to stay with my parents in this tiny rural remote town. So the town we're in now, it has 300 people, a um, bit of a change from Brisbane city, <laughs> but yeah, when, when we sort of oh, massive change. So yeah, when we, we did that and that was in July that we, we actually moved, but we made the decision really five weeks before that. So we didn't have long between making the decision and going. So obviously I had to put my graphic design course on hold and, you know, we got down to Tasmania. So I, once I realized I was going to have to do that anyway, I decided to just launch the business because the plan was always to offer more than just graphic design under my new business model. My work that I was doing prior to that was mostly in SEO, copywriting and social media. So I decided to launch with those two offerings and I'll come back to doing the graphic design course next year and then you know offer that as well underneath the same business umbrella but yeah I launched my business we've been here since um, late July and I have launched my business and like you know gotten clients and it's all kind of just up and running and it's just been a really wild sort of experience um you know getting everything together and Daniel's gotten a job and moved out to Launceston it's been a big year it has not been a little it's year. not even been it's not even been a year it's been like half a year like that's so much that for anybody to put into a 12-month period and you guys have somehow managed to do it in a six-month period let's just go back to you was talking about the sort of everything sort of aligned itself to becoming stepping stones to this particular move the move itself I remember when you were planning it obviously devastated that you guys were leaving Brisbane but super happy for you of course but it kind of aligned itself with your your values of wanting to be more sustainable and you you left the big smoke for a country farm how was that sea change for you guys it was I think it was a bit harder than if we had done it at a different time of year to be completely honest because it was so cold so we came from the Brisbane winter which is a very comfortable like 18 degrees, you know, or maybe it'll drop down to 10 overnight occasionally, but kind of sits around that 18 to 20, 22 during the day to the winter in Tasmania up near to the mountains where my parents are in this rural property where it was just like freezing cold. It was three degrees during the day. You know, there was a heap of rain that winter too. So the winter that we've just had, it was just like, pouring rain down here it was and you freezing. got snow it was so, for the first time it was a bit miserable but um yeah and I'd never seen snow and I don't think Daniel had either so we were both pretty excited about that the actual like the weather was a little bit of a bummer when we got here but I gotta say since spring has hit it's been much nicer because during winter there was nothing really to grow we had to kind of just look after the gardens care for them cut back growth and then you know, we were planting for spring and summer once we sort of came to the end of winter and then, you know, the end of spring. So it's been lovely now that you can actually go out and enjoy the kind of the grounds and the gardens and the orchard and all of that kind of stuff, because in winter it was all very, very cold and really, really icy. Yeah. But the experience of seeing the snow was pretty amazing that, you know, that really tops like my experiences this year is seeing snow for the first time. It was just really magical and really beautiful and just a lot of fun. That's gorgeous. I wanted to come back to that whole decision to move and, and that sort of thing, because it's such a big decision. I'm somebody who I've made those big moves and I find when you do those big moves that put you out of your comfort zone, you end up growing ridiculously and opening yourself up to so many new experiences and opportunities. And it must've been really 
quite scary for you and Daniel to pack up everything, everything that you've known for however long. Move to Tasmania, which we're in Australia, and I know it's part of Australia, but it's practically a different country. You have to go overseas uh, to get there. But like that in itself is terrifying Mm. for most people, but the rewards that come with it are incredible. So for me, when I moved from England to Australia, I found it really hard to get work. Like working was difficult. Now you, I don't know if, I don't know how you did it. Basically you, not only did you move to a different part of the country where, you know, you really only just knew your parents but you are at the same time setting up a brand new business. How on earth did you do it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a funny thing. And it's weird because, you know, even though the business is going well and I have plenty of work on, and I'm almost at a point now where if I take on much more work, that's regular, that's not one-off things, you know, like smaller contracts. If I have any more ongoing contracts, I will I'll probably have to think about outsourcing some work, but it's just, it still feels very much like I'm, I'm an imposter. Like I still have <laughs> mad, bad imposter syndrome. And I'm like, Oh, I, I, you know, I kind of run a business, I guess, but I really try to, even though that sits there with me all the time, I just don't let that voice have any space because it's taken up room in my head rent free and it just doesn't deserve to be there because I'm really, really good at what I do. And I know that I'm really, really good at what I do because every time I work with a client, I get amazing outcomes for them. And then I am reminded over again that I am good at what I'm doing and I know what I'm doing and I should be confident about it. But there is, you know, forever that tiny little like niggle of imposter syndrome. It um it was a bit rough, like launching the business. I think one of the things a lot of people struggle with when they're going to launch a business is you plan and plan for it. And I had been sort of putting building blocks together for what I was going to do once I finished my diploma in graphic design, which would have been around now. And, you know, it would have been like I launched in the new year. But I had been doing these like little building blocks of what I wanted for the business. I'd been running business plans, researching, designing the look at the brand, um, all of that stuff. I had been slowly building towards it. And I was at that and I was at my website building the website too for a good three or four months before I did launch. And I could have tweaked it forever. I could have just gone on tweaking it and not launching because there's always something that you think could be better that you want to change. But if you do that, you'll never have a business. And to be honest, to like your website now, when you first launch it is not as good as what it will be in three months. Like I've redone a bit of the website now, like I've tweaked a bunch of things like did that about two months into running the business. So Rochelle, what is it? Obviously you, you've gone down to Tassie, you're creating this business, you've got clients, you're doing great work, but what is the work that you're doing? Oh yeah. So should explain what I do. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my business. Um, so basically the elevator pitch for what it is, is I run Rochelle Hope Media Design and I chose that name to incorporate, you know, doing like possibly doing PR down the track as well. And also obviously doing the design part, the graphic design. So kind of encompassed all of that in the one. And basically the company operates to assist entrepreneurs and small businesses with streamlining their digital marketing and taking a holistic approach. So applying that understanding of SEO to social media and taking that brand awareness and that understanding of tone into the way that the SEO copy is written. So this kind of holistic approach of bringing a bit of SEO into your socials, a bit of brand into your SEO, and it's just a nice mix. So basically I do social media and um, SEO copywriting and the technical stuff as well with SEO, which is search engine optimization. I do technical SEO, which is the kind of backend stuff and the coding on page SEO, which is writing copy for website pages that then gets them to show up in search and off page SEO, which is basically ghostwriting for other websites in order to generate backlinks for a website. So I do all of that. And then on social media, Mainly the area that I work in is Instagram and Facebook. And I do a lot of Facebook marketing campaigns, all that kind of thing. I do social strategy and I do content creation as well because that works in well with doing the blogs. So yeah, I do all of that stuff. That's a lot. Now, for those of us who are listening, who heard all of those words you said and heard SEO 
and the back end stuff and all of that. What is it in like the most lamest of layman's terms that it is that you do? Not to degrade what you're doing down to layman's that's, terms, but no, you know, that's okay. Some people just to don't make, know the things. Yeah. To make it super simple for people, doing SEO basically means helping someone's website come up in search for their keywords. So if your website sells something like dog jumpers, then you would want to come up for the key search dog jumper, dog coverings, dog clothes. And so I create content and I edit the back end and the coding of a website so that it comes up for those keywords. And I also generate backlinks for that website as a part of an SEO strategy. So that's how SEO works. SEO is search engine optimization. And it is about writing blogs, writing product descriptions, writing the landing pages on websites. Uh, It's all of those things, plus a touch of coding and a little bit of backlinking. So guest blogging or ghostwriting for other blogs. And then obviously social media, people do understand. So that's easier. Don't have to explain that as well. Yeah. Now, for those people who do understand social media and actually want to get a real education in what it is that you do, your Instagram page is incredible. It's really, it really highlights what it is that you do and how the tiny little things that we do that sort of that we know we're doing and even the things we don't know that we're doing impact our presence on social media. So firstly, like the look and the branding of your Instagram page is stunning. It's pretty. I like it. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, it's really, it's gorgeous. But then you do a lot of reels and that sort of TikTok vibe type thing through your Instagram um, where can people find you and where can people, what are they going to learn from watching you, you know, do those funny TikToks where, you know, you're, you're the boss lady who's like sipping a coffee. And then the next minute it's like, and then you're like red lipped and stunning and ready to take down the corporate patriarchy. <laughs> and that is my total vibe. I'm here <laughs> for, um, you know, taking down the patriarchy main goal, but, um, basically <laughs> My Instagram is at Rochelle underscore hope underscore designs and you'll find me there, but I'm sure we'll chuck a link in the uh, show notes for today's show. Most definitely. Um, And basically on that, thank you. Uh, Thank you for the plug. But yeah, (laughs) on that, basically on the page, I use the Instagram mostly to educate people about social media and about SEO. And it's really helpful because then people can use that as something that they can refer to when they're trying to design their strategy but it's also just a funny thing to be on social media, using social media to talk about social media. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit meta, but um, it's quite meta. You know, I like it. Basically, I sort of I try to run people through a few little tips and things because the hard part is actually making the educational content that I create for socials something that is consumable within that small window that someone's looking at or reading the post, because I can't sit there and like write out this kind of five page educational, um, you know, kind of full strategy because people can't sit there and read that on their phones while they're going scrolling through. So you have to create really bite-sized education content um, for social media. If you are like, I'm a B2B business, so that's, you know, business to business, whereas most businesses are B2C. So, you know, that's business to consumer and a business to consumer marketing strategy is different and includes less education. Whereas my uh, marketing strategy for social media is very heavy on that educational element, like you're talking about, because, you know, being entertaining slash educational really brings people into your page and it makes them trust you. You want to build on that trust and help them so that they feel like you are an expert they can go to. So that's how my social media is kind of structured. And that's the content strategy that I follow. It has been really good. Do have to say I've been a little bit lazy the past couple of weeks. I do need to sit down and get into scheduling, but I'm just so busy now. (laughs) I'm like, oh no, I've got to put some time in here. Damn it. I started a business and now I'm successful. What am I going to do next? You I know. You did start the business and obviously the business is going really, really well, but you, it's not like you didn't have interesting career opportunities and an interesting career before moving into this. I mean, you 
worked in art galleries and you've done some incredible things, but, but what was the thing that really made you switch from doing the jobs that you were doing to going, you know what, I can do this. I'm going to be good at this. I'm going to change my career and change my life. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really good question because once you kind of get into a field, most people tend to stay within that field, but maybe niche down even harder. So in the art world, because I was a gallery director, curator, but uh, the thing about what I was doing was my role was so multifaceted because it was a not-for-profit that I did have to do all the PR and I had to do all the social media and I had to do all the website stuff. And, you know, I had to write all the blogs and because I had to have my hand in so many different things, that gave me the opportunity to really find out what I enjoyed about all these different parts of the job. And while I did love curating, I, it was really fun to organize and plan exhibitions. I really liked, you know, running events and stuff at the gallery. I organized lots of uh, interesting educational events, there, doing things like panel discussions and stuff. And I did a lot of fundraising, but it occurred to me after I'd finished up there that I think the part I enjoyed the most was really, uh, basically being a cheerleader for people Uh, like that's kind of what I described you know if you're in PR and if you're in that marketing area you're kind of a cheerleader for you know the person that you rep because it's about saying this person's amazing what they're doing is amazing and I felt that way very much when I would meet with all the artists I would be like but your work is amazing and it appeals to, you know, this particular audience and your style is amazing for this reason. And when you do your social media, you should be doing it like this because you'll capture that audience and you deserve to have an audience and make money from your art. And that was a lot of what I would do in the coaching that I had with um, all the artists at the gallery. So I guess that kind of led me into going, well, I really like that part of it. And the other thing was I, after I did PR, because once I left the gallery, I did PR for a while and then events management. And for both of those things, I kind of went, okay, parties and being out all the time, but it is expensive and it's tiring. And I, you know, for someone who kind of loves social media, I'm not that social. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of not, not my vibe to have to be around people like no (laughs) so she moved to Tasmania where there's like 300 people I know I moved to where there's no one because I was like nah (laughs) and I think the other thing was I after I left the gallery I worked under some people again and having run a space and you know been a boss and made decisions at the top level I did not like working under people (laughs) I was kind of used to being in charge and you know, I just realized, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to put time in to make other people rich anymore. I'm good at what I do and I want to make money for myself and I want to do what I want to do. And I want to decide what hours I work and decide what success looks what looks like for me because it looks different for everyone. So I love, you know, being able to run my own business and choose how it runs I work with the clients that I want to work with. I take the work that I want to take on. And I'm confident that if I want to take a break, I will take a break and not take on any new projects for a while because I'm comfortable doing that and then deciding, you know, when I'm ready to sort of get back into it. So deciding what is successful for you because it's different for everyone. And there's such a hustle culture out there for young business owners where it's like you've got to be here and you've been doing this and hustling and working 60 hours a week until you establish your business. And it's like, I'm sorry, were we not all doing this to avoid working 60 hours a week? (laughs) I don't want that. I want to be able to knock off at 11 a.m. on Friday like I did today and go, I'm done because I got all my work done early. And now I'm going to lie in the hammock and read a book and then, you know, do my bullet journaling for this week. Like I just, I like to choose how my life looks and, to just decide, you know, what I view as successful for me, because it is different for each person. I love that because you've actually just answered one of my questions and led into another one. So it couldn't be any more perfect. Um, So I I was going to ask how you define success. And obviously you've sort of touched (laughs) on that. But my other question was, how do you decide or sorry, how do you select the clients that you want to work with? Because that's a luxury that you have. It is to a degree. Like, I mean, it's, you know, there's definitely stuff where I'm going to take a client if it's going to be a good move for me, if the money's going to be good. And, you know, 
even if they're not the ideal client avatar that I have, I'm going to take them on if it's a good like learning experience or a growth opportunity for me and for the business. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, the way that I approach it, but I do have very specific modeled targeting for my ideal client avatar. And I research and design this ahead of launching my business. And you'll notice that my marketing is all hyper feminine And it is targeted completely at female entrepreneurs and solo entrepreneurs who are creative, basically. So there's a lot of purple and pink and, you know, there's a lot of this kind of stuff and it attracts a lot of creatives and a lot of, you know, smaller businesses, which I really like working with. Um, And it's good because it's kind of, I have prices at a point, a price point level that they can enter in at um, and they can afford to get some stuff done. And then, you know, they, they've they got to sort of be at a level where they're looking at outsourcing something. They need to have made enough money to do that anyway. So people kind of go, oh, but if you're targeting smaller businesses or entrepreneurs, you know, and like young women and stuff, does that not mean that you're not going to be able to get them to work with you because they don't have the money? It's like if they're looking outside and thinking about hiring someone, they have the money because yeah. they're putting enough energy into thinking about it that they've contacted me and they're, you know, wanting to meet up or talk about the opportunity. So yeah, it's kind of, it takes care of itself in that respect, the way that the targeting works. And I really mostly get approached by clients who I would want to work with. So that makes my life easier because it's kind of like I've got this bat signal out to, you know, a bunch of feminist women who are in business and that's what I get coming to me. So, yeah. I love that. It's this, it's so when you said that, you know, like the color schemes that you've put together for your website, it was that all researched and targeted specifically. Yes. Yeah. The whole thing was researched and specifically targeted all the smaller elements of my online persona. They're, they're me. It's a part of who I am. I love plants. I'm a total plant mom. I love having plants around and in my office and I treat them like they're little babies, but plant mom thing, that is a massive like millennial female business thing. It is a recurring theme that you see with a lot of women who are in business or who are trying to run their own business being a with building little indoor jungles it's a really big part of their side interests um so it's one of those things bullet journaling is another thing like that and i love doing bullet journaling frankly without it i would not get half the stuff i get done and the only reason i can manage like you know the excessive amount of work that i have on is because i schedule my life down to the moment with my bullet journals (laughs) but it's another little aspect that a lot of women in business are very into so even the smaller parts of my online persona that I share, they, they are very targeted within the niche that I want to work with. So it works really well. And the the coloring, the uh, font, the style of the website, the tone of voice for the brand is all like directly targeted at sort of millennial to generation X women in business. It's funny too, because as someone who knows you, I, to be honest, didn't even think that there was that much into the content that you're putting out and you know even down to the color scheme of the website and your Instagram because I was just like oh this is all just very you like it is like it's everything Mm -hmm. that you you release to the socials the videos the website everything as somebody who knows you just Mm -hmm. seems like it's you know Rochelle's gone oh these colors are really pretty together they complement each other and they're you know they're my kind of tones and aesthetic that I like so I'm going to use them and then the actual content that you do you know I know you to be you know very much a feminist and that sort of thing and you do you love the plants and you're a vegan and you're healthy and you know you do all these things so I had no idea that you'd actually put that much detail into the research and the execution I mean I was impressed before but seriously woman (laughs) well this is you know marketing done well is like that sort of level of um understanding and that's what you want to bring to the table but at the at the same time it's that sort of level of honesty too and you know repping for who you actually are being present in your brand because if the brand's not actually who you are then you're not going to work with people who are going to like that experience because they're going to be expecting you know what they're seeing and then they're not going to get it and that's, you don't want to disconnect between the two things. It has to be authentically who you are, but I'm definitely, 
you know, like everything, the, the brand online is filtered and it's filtered to let out specifically what is going to work within the niche of the audience and not like random stuff that I am into and then not into anymore, like sewing. I'm not going to go into my business account and be like, I'm sewing something. It's like, I, <laughs> yeah, that's not relevant. So it's not going up. You know what I mean? Now it so, goes for that I mean, sewing content. That, you have to log into a different account. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's the whole process and the research that goes into setting up a business, like apart from all the admin, the research, you know, about how to run the business, you know, how to set up the website and what people click through to what approach is best for, you know, the kind of warm up emails and stuff that you get, all of that, it takes a really long time. So it's a lot of work and anyone who's set up a business will know it's like, you know, a lot of background work that you have to do. I mean, I have a piece of evergreen content that um, sits there and generates click-throughs and, you know, it grows my email list for me and warms up clients and it will sit there for, you know, forever and be relevant. I have a question. Um, It's totally in my own podcast Mm -hmm. right now, raising my hand. Excuse me, I have something to say. What's evergreen content? (laughs) So when you're like, when you're talking about content, there's a lot of different like social media terms, but evergreen content is something that you can post and it is always relevant. It is not a time sensitive piece of content. It can always sit there, always be relevant, always be useful. Always be evergreen always be evergreen that's it okay. like it, it has no expiry it's evergreen content so for a business that might be something like a post where you introduce your team unless your team changes that piece of content will be evergreen something where you explain the process for ordering that's a piece of evergreen content for me the piece of content I have right now is a bit of a cheat sheet for um, Instagram And it's a really simple, like, you know, little five page cheat sheet that sits there every now and then I do a post that plugs it and sends people to the link um, in my link tree to download it. When they download it, I have a page set up on my website where they get sent to where they'll then get the download and they have to enter their email to gain the download. And then they get an auto email thanking them. And that can kickstart a campaign to try and get them to sign up for a social media audit. So, yeah. Okay. So, Rochelle, you, when you started your business, what were some of the challenges that you were faced with that you had to overcome? I mean, there's so many things when you do start a business that you just, you know, you don't expect and you don't think of. And some of that was the, like, amount of administration that's involved, preparing reports, getting insurance. You need professional indemnity insurance to operate as a copywriter and, you know, to do SEO Um, you need that for basically any freelance kind of position. So all of that kind of stuff, the imposter syndrome is really strong too, but uh, all of those things were challenges and it was hard to kind of back myself and overcome some of my fear about that and about, you know, things like just being concerned with how I looked online, you know, a small part of you does go, Oh, am I going to look silly to people doing this? And it's like, I'm sorry, do you care? Because they work their job that they don't like and you run your own business. Does not matter if you look silly? Like <laughs> You might look silly, but you're doing it on your own terms. Yeah, exactly. You choose why you look silly. So there, there were like, there was quite a few challenges to sort of overcome and get comfortable with. I had to write um, my contract. I had to get that contract. Like I've got a general contract that I then edit for each different, you know, uh, like, yeah, each different project that I take on. And I had to have that checked by a lawyer. There's a lot of red tape stuff that you don't think about registering the business name, all that kind of thing. Um, And all of that was a little bit challenging. Sometimes you would come up against something and you would just be like, I don't know how to fix this. And when it's your business, you don't have anyone to ask. Like there's no one to turn to and go, Oh, I'm having trouble with this thing. It's like, there's there's no one here. I'm not in an office. This is a room. (laughs) in my parents' house in the middle of nowhere. And if it's going to get fixed, I'm the only one who's going to do it. So you just have to learn. But I think all of that is really empowering because it makes you really understand that your capabilities are endless and you can learn anything and you can do anything. And everyone should be kind of open to learning 
anything they can, like any new experiences. I just, I think learning is such an amazing part of our lives. And we often put that to the back burner or we go, I don't have mental capacity. It's too hard right now. So I think that one of the great things that I've kind of gotten from all the challenges that I've had at the start of opening up the business is really just, yeah, coming around to accept that I am a bit of a lifelong learner and that I can do anything. (laughs) See, I'm a big believer in that we can do anything. I've had people mock me before when they're like, do you think you'll be able to do that? And I'm like, yeah, I can do it. And then my response is always, if someone else on this planet has learned how to do that, then there's absolutely no reason why I can't do that. You know, the only thing, or one of the only things I can't do is give birth from a womb. Don't have one of those. Not in my wheelhouse. I'll leave that to all the people who can do that and good on you. Uh, but yeah, if, if it's something that's educational, if it's something that's learned or a skill, anybody can do it. You might not be, you know, technically or mentally inclined to think that way, but you just retrain your brain. Simple, right? When you break it down like that, like it's obviously there's more to it. There's a lot of hard work into it, but if you really want to learn something, you can do it. Only person stopping yeah. you is you. Absolutely. And I think that way too. I kind of go, you know, and it's a big part of the thing that motivated me to go, right, I want to run my own business. I want to make my own money. I want to choose what my life looks like and how, you know, how I'm working, when I'm working, how much money I'm making. I want it to all be my choice. And I was sort of just able to do that, I think, because I looked at other people who ran their businesses and I went, I could do that. If they can do it, I can do it. And I don't kind of look at other people doing things and go, oh, you know, I'm better than them at this. I I don't think that way. I think that's such a negative outlook. And I think a lot of people used to think that way, especially a lot of women. We were kind of trained to look at each other as competition because if we were in competition with each other, it kept us down and it kept us keeping each other in check so the patriarchy didn't have to. Now that we're all working together, man, we're just going to take over the world. Not too long. Like watch out any old straight white man. We're coming for you. (laughs) Uh, That's the world I want. I want that world. I always remember being little and this is totally off topic. I remember being little and thinking, you know, being a closeted little gay kid. And I was like, one day all the people that have a problem with it will be bred out. They'll be gone. And yeah, they'll be gone. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be gone. And then we live in a world it is better. They had their time. They did their whatever. And then now it's our time. Yeah, absolutely. And the ladies yeah, have been pushed down for far too long. They have. That's right. And so have the queer men and so have, you know, the people of colour. And as we're sort of seeing the world change and as the, all of those rights are being fought for and, you know, those little steps are happening and they're all hard won, but we are getting there you know one stepping stone at a time and it's so fantastic to see it especially as we have more people and you know more women and more intersections who you know have been um, marginalized working together for the greater good of everyone is that your soundbite I think it is (laughs) (laughs) I love that for me I love that for you yeah, the, you know, the, the challenge is like they obviously there's a lot of stuff and it's hard to even think of, you know, all of the things that I've had to do. But another really big thing that like has been an issue for me since I started taking on clients was balancing how much work I was doing and how available I was to them because you learn something every time you take a new client on and with each client, they will have different expectations of what they want done and of when they're going to get a hold of you. And you learn what clauses you need to add to your contracts. You learn how much you need to sort of educate them on how the process works beforehand because you don't want them to be disappointed and you, you know, also don't want them to be expecting something that you can't deliver, which might be, you know, 24-hour contact or like something else. But, yeah, it's it's all that learning curve. And each time, you know, you get a little bit better, you get a little bit stronger, but, I think that it has really helped me to learn how to set really clear boundaries 
and to be someone who does track everything because I do bullet journal. So I track all of my activities, my hobbies, and I don't just track my work. I track what I need to get done in my personal life. You know, all of that is a part of my life running well. It is not just ticking off all these work tasks each week. It is, have I gone out for a walk in nature this week? Have I had coffee with my parents? Have I made dinner at least one night? You know, have I walked the dog this week? Have I stretched? Like all of that is part of what I track as well, which I think helps me keep uh, boundaries and balance, which is so important when you do run your own business because there are nights where I've been so busy with stuff, I've stayed up till 10 p.m., at the computer and I never mean to, but it just happens because you know that there's a lot of stuff to be done. So yeah, that those little things have definitely helped, you know, me sort of balance things out a bit better. So Risha, when you started the business, you had to try and capture an audience. Um, and you say you're quite active on socials. So how did you use social media to engage with either an existing audience or a non-existing audience and what did that look like yeah um it was it was a lot of work because what I did was I actually rebranded one of the Instagram accounts that I already had and ran and that had been for my artwork because as you know you would know Sean but your listeners wouldn't know this I actually was a painter um and I did that for a while before I ran the gallery And um, I had been using that Instagram kind of to promote what I was doing at the gallery and before that to promote my artwork. And I basically gutted it, rebranded it, and then launched, you know, the business from there, which was challenging in and of itself because while it had 200 followers when I relaunched it, I had to kind of grow it and get it appearing in the algorithm again. And because it hadn't been used in two years, it was not coming up in people's feeds, you know, it had been so inactive for so long. It was kind of like Instagram thought it must've been a dead account. So I had to work on building its reach again and getting it um, kind of favored again in the algorithm. So that meant going on every day, finding other small businesses, talking to them through Instagram, commenting on their stuff, providing value where they were asking for it. I made myself available weekly on stories to do a Q and a and um, had to like work on getting people to engage, you know, with their questions so that I had questions to answer on the Q and a and I had to just keep working at that. Reels were a big part of how I grew the account, but it went from um, when I first sort of started it back up, it only had a reach. It only got to a reach of about 2000 accounts Um, when I had first sort of started it back up, that was the number of accounts that were looking at my account or, you know, viewing my content. And I grew that in three months from 200 followers to 600 and a reach of 20,000. So it went pretty well, but it was a lot of work and that's what's involved. That's, you know, one of those things about social media, it's very much about, yeah, putting in the time and energy on that kind of thing. And I should be growing it again now still, but I have had to put it to the back burner because I've gotten so much work um, that I haven't been able to put the time into it. But I very much was targeting uh, mostly female entrepreneurs and small businesses, tried to sort of target local as well. So there's a lot of people around Tasmania, but I work with clients all over Australia. So it doesn't really matter whether I'm doing local stuff or not. And then I really worked on putting out content that was educational but entertaining and I used reels to my advantage as a part of my content strategy because that really pushes your reach out and lets you contact more people and get more people so yeah. So speaking of having a lot of work obviously you do you know, you have clients that come to you through your website you also work with other people in and out and I feel like I'll be doing us and my listeners, a great disservice if we didn't touch back onto the fact that um, you've also added a little bit more to your plant-based plate by relaunching your podcast, which is my favorite yeah. podcast <laughs> other than my podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, it's finally come back. I've uh, got three episodes out and I've got another one that I'm recording. So it disappeared for almost a full year because I am a lazy bitch. No, I just, (laughs) 
I was so busy and I felt, I think I felt like I can't come back if I'm not ready to give it my all. I was like, no, if I'm not ready to really dive back into it, I don't want to come back. So I really took a long break. And then I was, it was actually you and Benny that really inspired me to come back because you guys kept asking about it. And I was like, (laughs) see guys, if you nag and you (laughs) nag and you nag, you get what you want. (laughs) (laughs) It's how it works. So yeah finally back now and for the numbers it's edging in on being in the top 25 percent. so with podcasts if you're getting 75 downloads in the first seven days of an episode release your podcast for the numbers is in the top 25 percent of podcasts um and mine is averaging 69 68 each time in the first week so i feel like it's really, really close to getting there. And I really want it to get over that line and to get at least 75 downloads in the first week of every episode, because it would be great to go, oh, my podcast is in the top 25%. Woo. But then you have to be consistently in the top 25%, right? Because if you released another one true. and it was less engaging or it was, you know, a subject or a, a topic that, you know, people were less interested about, then you're going to get less full listens which would affect yeah. your outcome. So basically you just, you got to work, bitch. As Brittany, yeah, you gotta Brittany work Spears you once said, gotta you got to work, bitch. <laughs> uh, so what is, uh, what's next for you? Where is your business going? Where is the podcast going? And yeah, what, what's, what's, <laughs> what's 2022 looking like? Well, 2022 is going to be a big year. I'm actually fitting in a um, a little bit of traditional learning next year. So I'm going to be working in to do a cert for in leadership and management and to finish the diploma of graphic design. Some of that I'll be able to RPL as a result of what I've done with my business. So that will be helpful, but there'll be a few units that I do need to take as an actual course. So I'm going to be balancing fitting the study in, but I've also, I have a full business plan that documents three month markers, six month markers, one year, you know, eight months, two years, so forth. And what I wanted to grow to by those points and where I wanted it to be at. And I'm already well past my kind of like nine month marker for what I was hoping to, you know, have accomplished. So I need to review my business plan and decide if I want to uh, chase more work and perhaps get uh, an employee um, or if I want to change things up a little bit, restructure my whole kind of targeting and work with companies that are going to pay a higher rate. It's sort of, it's a matter now of deciding, do I want more work? And I run a company with, you know, uh, people under me, like employees, or do I want to change up my working schedule and make a bit more money per client and reduce down, you know, who I'm working with? Because that's kind of that point that I've hit now because the capacity is full but I could make more money. I could always make more money. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> I like money. It so gets you things. That's that's where that's at. I think what, it does get you things. <laughs> so I think what I'll do is I will be, um, I'm actually, I've got a couple more people interested in doing some short-term projects, but the ongoing work means that I will be pretty stretched over the next um, three to six months. So I'm sort of thinking now that I might, do that, then put my time into study and then review what I want to do at the end of 2022. And from there, I'll decide whether the business is expanding or if the shift um, and the focus is changing slightly. At this stage, I'm in a holding pattern until the end of 2022 and the finalization of study. And then I'll be making this the decision kind of forward from there. But the podcast is back, not going anywhere, going to be here fortnightly. Make a taint trace of soy. You can check out the Instagram. You'll find me there, you know, posting stuff now and again, posting any cool vegan stuff I find. I've got a cool podcast episode coming out next week, which is going to be about, um, it'll come out on Sunday and it's going to be about doing a zero waste Christmas and a green Christmas. And then I'll do one following that about New Year's goals. So Sorry, I was just getting excited about you zero waste green. Christmas. Oh, I thought you had something to say. 
No, um, the hand goes up for that. So one. yeah, those hand goes up for that one. So yeah, just those couple of things coming up with the podcast and um, you know, moving probably to Launceston because that's where Daniel's at. So likely wind up over there. What advice would you give to someone who is just starting out or thinking of a big career change, a big move, or to follow a passion? I mean, I think my one big piece of advice would be that you can do it. And if it's what you want, you should do it. Because even if it is hard, and even if that period of growth is a bit painful, and I'm not going to lie, this period of growth has been painful for me. There have been times where I have felt uncomfortable and I guess a little bit unsafe in my choices, a little bit scared of my choices. And you just push through it because it's worth it. And it's worth it to come out the other side and to have what you want. You're always only ever one decision away from completely changing your life. So whatever you want your life to be, you can make it that way. You just have to work out how you get there. And it's not always easy, but you can do it. There you go, kids. You heard it here first. You can do it. Just do it. Rochelle, (laughs) thank you so much for coming on my little podcast once again. Obviously, I love you to bits and it's always lovely to have you on, but it is also amazing and inspiring to see all these big changes that you've done, both you and Daniel, and you've taken yourselves completely out of your comfort zones and watching you both grow and have these wonderful successes is incredible and I wish that not just for you as my dear friends but I also wish that for everyone else and I wish it for me oh that's so sweet Shawnee and you know I I think that you will sort of have that as things go on you know I've spoken to you many times about how I think you would be great at doing what I do I think social media is your future my friend you heard it here first also people anybody out there who works in the social media world who wants to employ me i am up for employment come and get me um love <laughs> love you and i'm gonna let you go <laughs> thank you Rochelle. all right thanks John. thanks for having me on so folks that's a wrap on this week's episode of excuse me if you want to know more about what Rochelle is up to, if you want to reach out to her, ask her some questions about how you can improve your own business online or your socials, then you can head over to her website, RochelleHopeMediaDesign.com or follow Rochelle on Instagram at Rochelle underscore Hope underscore Designs and join her for her weekly Q&As, social media tricks and tips and so much more. And to check out all the latest from Rochelle's podcast, May Contain Traces of Soy, you can surf your way over to the show's website, maycontaintracesofsoy.com, follow along on Instagram at maycontaintracesofsoy, or search for the show through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite pods. All links are listed in the show notes of this episode for you. Now, as 2021 enters its final act, so does season two of Excuse Me. With only a few weeks and a few episodes left before the end of the year, brace yourself for some fun holiday content that will be coming your way before we take a break and come back in 2022 for season three. Stay safe, look after each other, and I'll see you next time.